Thank you for joining us for the 2020 Season of Light celebration. I'm honored today to have a special guest with us, a former prisoner of war, to share his testimony about how during a very difficult and dark time he found a way to overcome. I hope this brings a little inspiration to you as we go through this year together. Back in 1979, I was stationed in Germany and a task came down for someone to go work at the embassy in Iran. And being the way I am, I put my hand in the air and said, send me. And they said, only be for like 30 days. I got there, <clears throat> 30 days turned into 60 days. And then the next thing you know, uh, we were taken as hostages. Uh, and that was un very unexpected. And at first when they took me as a hostage, it was like, I don't want to use the word exciting, it was a certain adrenaline flowing. But then when they put the mask on me and tied my hands up, I realized that it has become real. And uh, every day was about the same. You were, I was tied to a chair, uh, my blindfolded, sometimes with a blanket over my head. I was uh, interrogated off and on. Um, once that was, they put a gun in my head, you know, and threatened to kill me if I didn't tell them what I wanted to know. And it was hard to focus on what you call it, the warrior thing, where name, social security number, and that's it. <laughs> you know, it was hard, trust me, uh, when you're going through these things. And there were times when they would put me in a car and drive me around and say, well, we're going to take you out and kill you. And after a while, you stop believing them. If you're going to kill me, kill me, you know? So, and the thing that kept me going was my family. I would think about, am I going to ever see my wife, my two daughters, and my son again? And that was a constant thought, you know? Uh, what are they thinking? How are they doing? How are they feeling? And it was just a dark time because I never knew if I was going to get out alive or if I was going to make it to the next day. And they would play games with us, like one guy would tie my hands up real tight and uh, mis misuse me, abuse me, whatever term you want to use. The next guy would come along, he would loosen them up and say, well, they shouldn't do that, you know, you okay, here's some water. And I realized later on it was uh, what you see on TV, the good cop, bad cop. <laughs> I'm your friend, tell me everything. <laughs> and that's the game they played. And fortunately, I was being nosy when they took over the embassy. One of my jobs was to go into the comm center and help destroy the materials. And I was standing in my office looking out the window when they finally came in and I got locked out of the comm center. And that was kind of like a blessing, I guess, because if I had been locked in the comm center, I would have stayed the whole 444 days. Because the other black guy that was in the comm center, he stayed the whole 444 days. And they used my race against me also. I would hear it constantly that uh, how they treat black people in the U.S. We're going to let you go early because blacks and females have been uh, mistreated in the U.S. And it was like, I'm an airman. Color doesn't matter, you know? <laughs> I'm an airman. I'm not a white airman. I'm not a black airman. I'm an airman. So, but when they released me, it was hard because I felt as though I was leaving my comrades behind. And come to find out, they call it Stockholm Syndrome or something when you're released and the other ones stay behind, you feel certain guilt. And that led me into feeling guilty a lot. And I didn't seek help at first. It was a long time. I told myself I had this magic key. You know, I would go in this rabbit hole and I would be nasty to people. I would be indifferent. And then when I got divorced and got married again, my wife said, you need help. 
<laughs> I said, no. I, I, I tell this joke sometimes. I'm an airman. I'm tough. <laughs> and my daughter and my wife would lay. OK, airman. <laughs> and I finally did seek help. And that's the best thing I ever did. Uh, I saw going to the VA hospital, to the clinic there. Uh, my wife got involved. And even now, when my wife and daughter are around this time of year, it's really a bad time for me. I get those, uh, what they call, triggers. You know, I had one other day, and both of them, you're not going down that rabbit hole. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that. And let's go shopping, or let's do this. And for one, I hadn't did it in a long time. I said, leave me alone. I just want to be alone. And I realized when I said it, you said the wrong thing. <laughs> but the VA hospital uh, really helped me out. Going to therapy, I would go three times a week. And I stopped going for the main reason that my therapist left. And I didn't want to tell the story over again and go through the whole thing again. During this time in Iran, I was kind of like a, I want, what do you want to call it, faithful person? And the first couple of days, it was like praying and, OK, God, here's your opportunity. And then all of a sudden, it was like, he's not coming. He's not coming. And I started to lose my faith in God. And it was hard to get it back. And I got it back. Because as my wife told me sometime, he doesn't, how you say it, he doesn't come when you call him, but he comes when you need him. But I wanted him right then and now. <laughs> take this off of me. Take this away from me. So I found it with her. Uh, I realized that I was faulting God for something that really wasn't there. That uh, he's not going to take care of everything when you want him to take care of everything. 